the angel Gabriel, was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is in the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. My dear faithful, we're very blessed as we celebrate the feast day and our solemnity today, the feast day of our Archdiocese, to have the relics of Brother Andre with us. And it's a great gift for us and through other places in the diocese, it'll be going to Dourdes as well and throughout Canada. But especially for our Mass today, that we make a special prayer of intercession, we'll say a prayer afterwards as well and incense the relics and say a special prayer of intercession to Brother Andre for us today as we reflect on this wonderful mystery that's given to us in the Blessed Mother who is so close to us in this archdiocese and close to every Christian, every Catholic, for whom Christ is their leader and their savior. And as we make that prayer today, we reflect that we, this beautiful solemnity falls within our preparation for the Feast of Christmas and so the two feasts and the celebration we have together enfold within each other so wonderfully for us to reflect on so many things that take place in our reflection these days. Our first reading teaches us something we know from experience, something we know as the church teaches us from our catechism as youngsters right through until the last breath we take that in the existence we have in this world right now, there is an alienation between ourselves and the divine. There is an alienation that comes from the very fact that at some stage, man and woman, but humanity stepped away from God and created this alienation, which makes it so difficult for us to understand the ways of God. And as we live in this world, 
in this condition of sin as well as our own sinfulness in our own hearts and our own lives we know the frustrations of what it is to yearn for the divine to know our weakness in trying to achieve that or trying to achieve any communion with the divine our frequent failings when we do when we live our lives and again that instinctive knowledge that we have within ourselves of that absolute need for the divine in our lives to live a fulfilled human life and we teach that to others in the testimony of our life in the teaching of our catechism the teaching of our faith to everyone teaching that Christ is the only one who will fill our hearts when we empty them ourselves and there is no other solution there's no other happiness in life for any of us but to see the roots of it to see how we are separated is also good for us to reflect upon how majestic God is and how far his being and the reality of which he lives is from our existence here. And we have made the mistake through the centuries, as we still do today, of trying to think like God and in fact pulling God down into our existence so that he thinks our way and that he acts our way and he teaches us again and again, sometimes rather roughly, that your ways are not my ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts. And it's almost this instinctive pride within us that if we can pull God down into our existence, then we can control God and everything will be fine. And then the very act of doing that, we lose everything. And this dynamic falls itself out through the centuries until God decides, even in his distance from us, to breach that gap and to become born among us in the feast of Christmas that we have. And as he does that, we know from the Gospels and the rest of our liturgical year that it brings on a violence within the world itself because of the friction of God entering into history and into the world. It's in a way that these things don't completely fit because of the condition in which we live. And we see that friction in those who close their hearts and harden their hearts to the Gospel, leading up all the way to his death and the sacrifice that he gives. And we see that also within our own hearts. When we sin, we don't want to be in God's presence, just like in the first reading with Adam and Eve today. We make up excuses, or we make things as we want to make them, as opposed to the purity and sometimes the incisiveness, incisive nature of God's word as it enters into our hearts. Mary plays this enormous role for us because she becomes one of these first bridges for us it happens in the Old Testament for us with these wonderful signs of God speaking to prophets and those of the past and the incredible things that take place in the miracles. But Mary bridges this gap for us today by the fact that she's first of all preserved for us and she has a facility because she's been preserved from sin to accept God and to live in these two worlds almost in communion where we find it so difficult, she has that facility to be able to live in both worlds, to think like God thinks, to speak like God speaks, and yet to exist in our world. And we see how much the pride of our sinfulness pulls us back from being able to do that, and she is given to us, first of all, to be that messenger, but also the one who then can fulfill by accepting Christ within her of God coming into the world. And in this we see in her encounter today with, the, with Gabriel, all of these things playing out as she, in perplexed nature, asks about these things. And everything by the time of this concept of a conception of Christ within her, everything now changes again because she's overwhelmed now by the presence of God within her. Not just preserved from sin, but now overwhelmed by the fact that the word exists within her. And now everything changes. Her relationship with Joseph, marriage, virginity, everything changes but doesn't change for the worse. It changes for the better because she is bridging these two worlds that we find so difficult to bridge. And Christ comes down into the midst of this through her instrumentality and now becomes for us the means through her intercession but Christ becomes the means in which when the word of Christ reigns within our hearts we then strive and fall and strive 
to live in these two worlds together. And even as Christ lives in the world with his disciples, weak men like ourselves who find it so difficult to understand how God thinks as they stumble and stumble once again about how to live this fact that they're disciples. Only after the resurrection, when they're full of the Holy Spirit and the protection the Holy Spirit gives to them, do they start to flourish and bear the fruit that the church does, but that does through God's providence. And then we see how this word then rests within ourselves. Not just the word that is preached to us, not just the word of the gospel that is proclaimed to us, but the word which is the gospel of the good news, which includes all of our sacraments, everything that is part of the life of the church. And when those things re reside within our hearts, not to the extent that they did with Mary because of the blessed and favorable nature in which he had, then we're able to live these things and as we purify ourselves through this life, to live in these two worlds with as least tension as possible. And whenever we fall, we know we have the sacraments to get us back to that stage again. But that desire within our hearts is strengthened and strengthened and strengthened to begin to think like God thinks, to speak like God speaks, to have our hearts changed and purified to be like the sacred heart of the one who is born of the Blessed Mother. And this becomes our great joy. And on a day like today, we see the instrumentality, but the great gift she is for us. That she, not wanting to be distant from God, as in the first reading after sinfulness, wishes always to be in the presence of God, right up to the end at the time that he gives his life when all the others run away. Will she remain with us and with the church? Always. Will she remain with our archdiocese and those who dedicate themselves to living the Catholic life? Always. And for that, we're so blessed to have her as our patroness and the one who protects us and also leads us as example, but also the grace that is given to her. As we celebrate this Christmas, let us keep her close. Let us make this a Christmas that is a special Christmas, and we still have these wonderful 17 days to go for the celebration and to allow that to last right through the 12 days that we celebrate, to recognize the gift, first of all, of God humbling himself to be born into our condition, and for us today, of giving us a mother who becomes an instrument for us even in the living today, to be present with us and to be present in the mysteries of Christ's life of the rosary that are so present in our life daily. And allow these blessings, allow the treasury of these mercies and graces that are given to us to reside within our hearts and expand through our actions, through our words, and through our love into the world of the brothers and sisters that we meet.